For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Our text today is is uh, 50 through 52, but I am going to look also in our study in, in a, let's see, 41, 41 through 46, but here I am at 50, Genesis 41, 50. Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenna, the daughter of uh, Potipharah's priest on, of uh, On, he, he would be um, he would be the equivalent to Israel. This would be equivalent to a high priest, a, a supreme. He would be the supreme. He would be he would be a, the priest to Pharaoh of the priesthood and and he would be the supreme um, and uh, he has a part of the part of promoting uh, Joseph we'll talk about it in a moment part of the promoting of Joseph uh, to a second in command of rulership required him to be authorized within Egypt, Egyptian protocol. And there were five things that had to be done in order to bring him into that position of prime minister as a foreigner. And one of them was to, since he wasn't married, this qualified him, uh, to, and so... Uh, Pharaoh saw that he married the daughter of the supreme chief. Uh, the, the, the supreme um, priest. Did I say that? Supreme pri priest. And they have had, during the years of plenty, I think I'll say that in a moment, um, but during the years of plenty, during the seven years of plenty, they had two children, two boys. And what is interesting, uh, Don made mention of this one day when we were going through a study, and he said, he said something to the effect that the naming of these children are very important to the history. Uh, they're certainly important to the history of the tribes of, of uh, Israel. Joseph is taken out, and the two sons are added, and yada yada. So, but um, but the two names of the sons are very important to my study today, because he named them based on reflecting of his life in Egypt. And the first son he reflects back on his early life, and the last son he reflects on his future life. And that's very important because what actually in the plan of God is going to happen is it's part of his super grace status. So, and, and I'll show it to you as we go through there. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh for he said, God has made me forget all of my troubles and all of my father's household. So that's when he first come to Egypt. Okay? That's, he's reflecting back on that. In verse 52, he named the second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my afflictions. Okay? And, and that's really important because what he's reflected back on is his spiritual growth journey. And, and that's wonderful to our study tonight uh, entitled 
super grace blessings because that's what he's talking about here in the reality of his life. Um, so let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to get into this study on super grace blessings. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit the privilege of confession of sin if necessary. And it would be necessary if you're aware of carnality, you can't study the Bible in carnality, identity, identifying carnality of your life as personal sin, it could be in th at least three, three categories that we mention, and that would be mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. And, of course, personal sin unconfessed hinders the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially in Bible study. And so what is necessary is for you to confess your sin through your priesthood. You have that privilege in the church age under the new covenant of 1 Peter 2 to confess your sins according to, for example, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That cleansing is for sanctification, not for salvation. The cleansing that's mentioned in 9 for sanctification, that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, goes back to verse 7, which is cleansing for salvation. Because you have been cleansed for salvation when you believe the gospel, that is now available to you to get you back into fellowship as a believer. As a, as a, a, when you confess your sins, it brings you back into fellowship of the, of the third member of the Godhead who indwells your body according to the first Corinthians 6, 19, and 20. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that, both that those are here in the classroom as well as those who are in the classroom of the Internet. So I give you that moment. I give you that moment. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way, both by automobile and Internet, to study with us out of the 11th, Toledoth, the final section of the book of Genesis. We're, we're looking at Joseph and how God is blessing him through his spiritual growth maturity, uh, a principle that we call super grace, and we'll explain that tonight, and how important it is for us to reach it and maintain it to die in grace. And we see some of the blessings that he has given and, and the blessings that he can relate to. He's reflecting on them. And he is telling you by the names of his children how thankful he is for your faithfulness and presence, never leaving, never forsaking, always present to carry him the distance, always being sure that he's going to finish strong, run that race, finish that course, keep that faith, and, uh, and he's an encouragement to us. He's a, he's, a, he's a guy like we are, human being saved, going through a lot of adversities in his life, and he's come off smelling like a rose, as we say. We need to hear that. We need to be part of that. We need to see his reflection on how God was faithful and how God prospered him in his journey for him. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when you look at the same chapter 41 and you, you look at 41 through 46, <clears throat> it tells you Joseph, uh, Pharaoh is going to promote him into the second of command and he has a Hebrew slave that he's about to give enormous authority to him. And he is going to bring him into that position through a protocol where nobody will question him or challenge him. When times get tough, nobody's going to have the right to question his authority because it comes from Pharaoh himself. So there's this protocol 
and I've listed them. Uh, he is about to step into royal, a royalty position, a second only to Pharaoh himself. And so when you read through verses 41, we won't read through it, but when you read through 41 through 46, you will see that protocol. And I just listed it in a simple way for you. He's going to be given the royal insignia ring of Pharaoh. He's going to be given the royal robe with a gold chain that was very important, showing command. That would be, that would be like in the military where you get ranking. This would be, uh, that th th this would show that. Uh, he's going to he's going to ride in a royal chariot, uh, second in command. Every time, every time uh, Pharaoh's chariot leaves, his chariot is always going to be second in position. Um, uh, if that chariot's out by itself, everybody's going to know that that's chariot. That chariot represents Pharaoh. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be a chariot that looks like everybody else's chariot. It's going to be a chariot that looks like Pharaoh's chariot. Um, he's going to be given an Egyptian name. He will be known by an Egyptian name. And he is given a royal Egyptian wife. A, a pedigree, a, an Egyptian thoroughbred. <laughs> okay? I mean, a, a, a trophy wife of the Egyptians. Now, the good thing about this is Joseph's attitude. Here's the good thing about Joseph. Joseph's attitude is one of, I thank you, God. I, I thank you for the ring, the robe, the chariot, the Egyptian name that has meaning to the Egyptians and, and this wife. You know, there are a lot of ways I suppose you can get a mate. This is handed to him, right? But I'll tell you, Joseph knows that God picked that mate for him. And you can see it in the way he reflected his, his two sons. In uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. And how he just reflects on these two children in his, uh, and how did he get these two kids? He got him through this Egyptian wife. And you can see he's so thankful for that. You know? At some point in your marriage, you've got to come to agree, agree with God that he's given you the right person. And accept it. Accept it as grace. I can't tell you how many people I meet who are in their marriage. They've been in there a while and want out when they should want in. And as long as you want out, you're never going to get in. And once you get in, you're going to find out you can swim. But it's biting that bullet of surrendering to where God has put you and accept it. I mean, your pit can change, you know, by the grace of God, can it? Your pit can change. Your prison can change. Joseph tells you that the pit is not your home. It's your gym. Prison is not your home. It's your gym. It's your training ground. If you learn anything else from Joseph, learn that. He always flipped it to God. I think sometimes we don't see it as God has placed it in our life. So, it is good. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't good. And uh, Joseph had this.
when you study his life, the more you study it, I don't know how many times I've studied his life, and this is not a study on the life of Joseph, but you're just attracted to it. A guy like me at least is. I'm just attracted to this, this guy who puts his pants on like I do, and yet I just stand in awe of his ability to constantly adjust in his life to the grace of God. No matter what is thrown at him, he takes a deep breath and makes an adjustment. And uh, that's pretty amazing to me. That's pretty amazing to me. When he walked into Egypt, he didn't have a penny in him. He had $20 on his head and nothing in his pocket. And now he's second in command of everything. He is royalty. And can I tell you that's true with you? When you come to believe in Jesus Christ and enter into that wonderful journey with him, you are already in the status. I mean, who would have ever believed when, when Joseph came into Egypt that he would be one day second in command only to Pharaoh and that actually he would be considered the father of Pharaoh? I mean, think of that title. And yet, that's what God has in store for all of us. If we would just follow his lead in our life when we're in the pit, use it as a training center. When we're in the prison, use it as a training center. Because one day, one day, he's going to put us out of there. And we've got to be better for it, not worse. So often we go into these experiences, we come out worse because of our attitude. We don't come out better. I see people get married. And they say it's the worst thing ever happened to me. I say, how can that be? It's a divine institution. You've, you've got a terrible attitude. And your marriage won't change because your attitude won't. The pit will always be a pit. You can change that because God has made it different. I mean, do you realize your body is the temple of God and yet, <laughs> and yet you grumble and gripe about it all the time? It's the temple of God. It changed. Why don't you change with it? <coughs> you know, there's two times when God is going to tell you your body's not your own. The first time is when you get saved. 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, verse 20. You're no longer your own. Your body belongs to him because it's the temple of God. The second time is when you get married. Paul says, but your body's not your own. It belongs to your mate. Your body belongs to your mate. Well, anyhow, during the seven years of plenty, uh, God added two more. Uh, these five things, the signet ring, the royal stuff, is our, our super grace blessings. You can see that, can't you? I mean, these are so far off. Super grace blessings are not things you earn, get, deserve. They're not a promotion at work because you've, you've worked hard and earned it. All of these things are, come from the grace of God. They don't come from the energy work strategy of man. These five things, these royal five royal things were given to him by the grace of God. He didn't earn them, didn't deserve it. Pharaoh could have picked a number of people for this. God picked him. And listen, and nobody knew it better than him. God, he, he, he says this over and over. God sent me to preserve two nations. God sent me. God sent me. That's a, that's a powerful idea, isn't it? And so when he gets two sons, we have two more grace, super grace blessings because, listen, both of these are part of the plan of God. He, he becomes royalty of Egypt because that's part of the plan of God. It's a way to preserve two nations, agreed? And he gives them two sons that are super grace blessings because they're going to be part of the 12 tribes of Israel. And listen, they're going to be unique. Manasseh's the firstborn, Ephraim's the secondborn, yet when Jacob blessed them, when he blessed them as a patriarch, he flipped them. He, he put the secondborn first. Ephraim, which is really important to what Joseph saw him and named him as. And Joseph didn't even realize it when he did it. 
how significant it was going to be in the bigger picture until later. I mean, sometimes we just do the will of God. We just drive forward and later we'll back and we go like, whoa. <laughs> whoa, did that work out good? <laughs> whoa. That's one of those deals. I mean, Ephraim. Ephraim became ten tribes. Ephraim known as Israel. I Israel known as Jacob. I mean, what a status. Well, anyhow. It, it, it's just interesting. Joseph names his two sons, this point one. Joseph names his two sons to reflect two spheres of reaching and maintaining super grace status. And it shows how it affected his life. Joseph names his first son Manasseh, and it reflects his earlier stage of reaching super grace status. Now, we'll come to see this in a moment. Here are six stages of grace. And we're going to look at this in a moment. But right here, we're going to call this Super Grace 1. We're going, and we're going to watch this now. And we're going to call this Super Grace 2. And we're going to call this Super Grace... I'm going to put a line through there so we know it. So that's not a 6, that's a grace. 3. These are really important. And... When he talks about Manasseh here, he's talking about this stage where he has, when he came into Egypt, he was a spiritual mature person. He had just entered into super grace, spiritual maturity. And he's going to get blessed here. Right? And I just named him. I, I hit five out of the royal and two with the son. When he names the second son, He's over here. See, he's over here on the first one, and he's over here on the second one. Now, here's what's important, and we're going to see this. This is where he reached super grace. He reached it. Here, he's maintaining it. Maintaining until... Dying grace. That's Joseph. That's Joseph in Egypt. He goes into Egypt, a spiritual mature guy. Just hit it. Just reached it. Just reached it. Now, in this experience he's having in here with adversity, he's going to reach it. He's going to maintain it through adversity. Potiphar, prison, He's going to, and listen, he's going to maintain it all the way to dying grace. This is quite a guy. And the naming of his two sons, here's his first son. He looks back at the journey to get here. The second son, he, he, he's in a maintaining of how he knows where God, what, God, what God is doing with his life. This is where it dings in him. Right here is where it rings bells that God has sent me to preserve. And once that clicks at this stage with Ephraim, where God is now fruitful in my life, the second son, this guy is off to the races. This guy is off to the races. So, We'll see that in a moment with this. With Manasseh, God has made me, watch what he says, God, with, with Manasseh, God has made me, God has made me to forget all of my troubles and all of my father's household. See, that's his journey out of the pit, right here, out of the pit into Egypt. He's reflecting. And listen, we all do that. I'm glad I'm not there anymore. I'm glad to be where I am. I'm glad, but I wouldn't take anything for the journey. I don't want that again. If I, I don't hope I don't have to do that again. But I'm thankful for it, for what I've learned about myself and my relationship to God, how it's developed me in my relationship with the Lord. How we, we, we would hear things like, how closer I feel with Him, how, uh, what I have learned 
is unmistakably who I am today. That's, that's pretty powerful stuff. That's what it means to be super grace. That's, this is, I'm talking about being able to... Re now, listen, it's not hard to get here. It's not hard to get there. It's not hard to read super grace. Secured in your salvation puts you there. Secured in your salvation, when you're secured in your salvation, you are now ready for meat. Once you're on meat, you're ready to reach into super grace. You're into early, early spiritual maturity. You're spiritually advancing believer. You're eating meat. When that becomes a consistent diet, walking in the spirit, walking by faith, inhale, exhale, and it's a part of my maintenance of life, consistently inhale, exhale, you have reached super grace and you're in super grace one. And when you get to super grace two, light bulbs are going to go off. Things are now beginning to fit together. You're beginning to see a lot of bigger pictures about your life. You'll see bigger pictures about your marriage, about your family, about your church, about your ministry, about this and about that. And when you do, a, a lot of chichings is going to happen in your soul. A, a lot of wonderful things. God is going to let you get into a larger picture. You're going to be able to understand that my ways are higher than yours and my thoughts are higher than yours. And you know that because you've experienced it. You have grown into that. And you wouldn't have it any other way anymore. You wouldn't have it any other way. That's when he'll make you fruitful, but he cut because it doesn't matter. It's not my goal in life. <laughs> my goal in life is not to have the signet ring and the royal chariot. It's to have God as my dad and be appreciative of it every day. No, he walks with me and talks with me. And will tell me all of my. Yeah. In the second son, he says, God has made me fruitful in the land of my afflictions. You know what he says? He says, look, at, I could have focused on suffering. Wait for my family. Thrown in prison. All these things. I could have done that. I Man, I, I had a lot to focus on if I wanted to, but I didn't. You know what I did? I threw it away. I threw all that stuff away. I focused on God. I focused on my walk with the Lord. I walk with Him, talk with Him, shows me my ways. Why would I, why would I want anybody else? Pretty good. So he... God has made me. Notice he said this two times. God has made me fruitful in the land of my afflictions or suffering. At the time of entering Egypt as a slave, Joseph had reached the, a spiritual maturity or super grace status one and would go through intense adversity and prosperity training in the angelic conflict. <laughs> if you think you're going to be able to go to class and study the Word of God. Listen, you're going to have conflict because you live in the devil's world. Uh, um, what is that? Matthew 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation. It's either Matthew or John. Maybe John 16, 33, in the world you have, I don't know. It's Matthew or John, I don't remember. 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good courage, I've overcome the world. Probably John. Sounds like John, but somewhere in there it is. So, listen, you live in a world, you're going to have tribulations. The thing to do is to live above them. Okay, John 16, 33. They, you're going to have tribulation. You live in a world, you're going to have tribulations, but be of good courage. That's a mental attitude. Courage is an attitude. It's an attitude. Be of great courage. I've overcome the world. The world can't mess with you. I've overcome the world. I mean, that's... That's bigger than the conflict. <laughs> now, this up here, watch this now. When you hit super grace, this right here 
this journey, reach, maintain to thine grace. This is called desert training. This is called the desert phase. Nobody gets there without it. You're not going to get your tabs from ranger school unless you go through it. You're not going to get them. You got to get through it. Got to go through desert training. And let me tell you the guys who went through it. You can study this on your own, but I wrote, out, I wrote it down here. Job. Job went through it. Job went through it, desert training, suffering, <coughs> suffering. Listen, loses everything. But you can't lose everything when you have God. So God did what? Gave it twice back. You don't lose anything. When God puts you through training, you don't lose anything. You come out better. It's not a pit. It's a gem. It's not a prison. It's a gem. It's not a hospital. It's a gym. It's for training. Moses went through it in Exodus. Exodus, the third chapter and the fourth chapter. You ought to read that. Moses went through it. He actually went through it in the desert. Joshua and Caleb went through it in Numbers 14 when they went through the literal wilderness. Only three guys, only three guys came out of Exodus that actually, actually got to the promised land and only two of them got in. Think about that. 600,000, 600,000 men, registered fighting men came out of Egypt. You're talking about two, two and a half million people or more. If you're counting dogs and kids and cats and I don't know. And Joseph is going through it. Listen, you're going to go through it. And it's a good thing. It's going to make you a great warrior for God. Because you understand that it's all about God. It ain't about you. It ain't about you. It's not about you. You don't get through desert training if it's all about you. They, when it's all about you, they are first to fall out and go home. And, they, and, and listen, you want them to because they're not going to be warriors. You want them to go through it to be warriors. And that's what God is looking for. That's what he's talking about in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 10 through 17. Put on the full armor of God. For what? Parade? You think it's for parade? You think it's just to look good? That's what Sunday church is about for most people. Just parade. They wear the armor as parade. They never use it in combat. They wouldn't have the idea how to use it. They don't even know what it is. But if you'll grow into spiritual maturity, God will teach you what each, each of those weapons are for and how to use it in his power and in his strength to be victorious. He don't give it to you because you can, you can do it. He gives it to you because you know you can't do it and need him to do it. Listen, then you're missing Ephesians 6.10. You've reading about the armor and forgetting how the war is fought, how the weapons are used. That's, that's verse 10. <clears throat> now, six stages. I want you to make sure that you know these six stages of grace. Here is saving grace. Here is saving grace. Where's all started? Jesus dies for your sins, buried, raised from the dead, third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, you know that. Romans 1, 16, the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes. When you believe, you enter into grace salvation, grace salvation, that's saving grace, that's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves as a gift of God. Once you are saved, 
the next grace that you will become part of is called logistical. Logistic grace. That is God will take care of you. You belong to God. You, you, you belong to the family of God. At the, at the crucifixion, when you accept the gospel, you become a member of the family of God, and God is your dad. He is your, your father, and you are his child. And you will always be that forever. And he, as a good parent, takes care of you, just like he talks about in, Rome, in, in uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, when he talks about disciplining his children. He says, I discipline you in love for your good. Logistical grace is how God takes care of you. This is that, this is that um, Matthew 6, 11, thereabout, when he says, when we pray that prayer, uh, in our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And, he, and we say, give us, the, give us this day. Our, who are you talking to? Who's going to give us? Publix? Huh? Walmart. Who's going to give us our daily bread? Listen, when you read the Psalms and the Proverbs, one of the things I love about reading about it, uh, even in the book of Job, when God challenges, at the end of the book, when he challenges Job, he says, who do you think feeds the birds? And, and when, the baby, when the baby eagles high up on the mountain cliff, when they cry for food, who do you think responds to them? How about that? Their heavenly father does. He hears their cry for food and brings it. Logistical grace is God will take care of you. He will take care of you by your need, not your want. You need to spend more time praying about what you need and not what you want. I hear more... I, and listen, kids, they, they mimic the way their parents pray, I think. So they mimic somebody. They don't mimic God. And they're always praying for what they want. They think it's Christmas. They're always praying for what they want and not what they need. I, and I spend a lot of time with my grandkids. I have them praying for me. Uh, they, set up my, they put their feet under my table and eat a sandwich with me. They pray. I want to hear their prayer when they're through uh, as we're eating. I say, can I share something with you, boys? Let me show you something in the Bible about prayer that's really important because prayer is really important. Would you go, oh, yeah, grab a prayer. Oh, yeah, prayer, prayer. And you guys are doing a wonderful job. But you do, you're, you're driving the automobile, automobile but quite don't understand about it. That you, don't, you don't understand the signals and, and all of that. And if they went out, you don't know how to stick your hand out the window and, and do that stuff. They go like, stick my hand out of the window and do what, Grandpa? <laughs> they don't know anything about, isn't that crazy? They don't know anything about hand signals. Yeah, they don't know anything about hand signals. So it gives me an opportunity to do other things with them. But listen, most of all of us, we pray for what we want and not what we need. But anyhow, but anyhow, so logistical grace. This on your paper now. You know, you, I'm on the other side of the paper now. I know. Yes. All right? I'm on the other side of the paper. Now, listen, under, now, the most famous passage up here for this is Philippians. You know this, 419. God, God will what? Who will? Who, who will? God. <laughs> God. And you know why he will? Because he's your daddy. And he loves you. Listen, he loves you more than you will ever know, as the old saying goes. Oh, we know he sent his beloved son. But he said, for God so loved the world that he did that. That's an awesome statement. That's an awesome statement. So you know how much he must have loved his son to do it. God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory. And then John, the sixth chapter, I, I like that one. I, I added that to your paper, John, the sixth chapter, 31 through 35. And, and, and he's talking about the manna, 
how God took care of the, and then he says, oh, where do you think that bread came from? Oh, they went, I got this one. I got it. This would be Peter. I got it. I got it. Uh, Moses. Yeah, he said, yeah, I hear that. That's a popular opinion. Wrong. Eh. No, he says it comes from God. Uh, and, and, and listen, I'm that bread that actually came from me. I'm that bread. I'm that bread. And you know what? That bread went to the cross, and we take it in the Eucharist. Come on now. That bread went to the cross. That bread is the body of Christ that went to the cross. That's the first thing we take in the Eucharist. Whew. I don't know if that ever rings a bell, but it should. And then we hit spiritual growth, number three. One, two, three, spiritual growth. Maturity. Maturity of spiritual growth. Spiritual growth, maturity. Second Peter 3, grow in grace. Grow in grace and knowledge. Ephesians 4.13, uh, grow into the mature person of Christ. When you hit super grace, you, are, you have now reached that status of being in Christ in, in that place where Christ is now mature in you. See, it starts out a baby, then moves to immaturity. You know, you know what's interesting when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, when you look at his life? You got a birth. Then he disappears. You don't see him. He's gone. <laughs> Drops back into the history at the age of 12. Gives a little glimpse of where he, what, what he's been doing over 12 years. <laughs> Drops out for 18 more years. Think about that. Drops out of existence for 18 more years. What's happened to this guy? Ah. Huh. <laughs> he shows back up. Guess what's happened? Maturity. You know where he's been? He's been in desert training. He's been in desert training. God has been preparing him to go to the war of wars and win the battle of battles. He's going to go to the cross and die for humanity. He's gone through the desert. took him 18 years to go through the desert phase. And we know he was successful because when he entered his his ministry, the first thing he was done in Matthew 4 was a training exercise to see if he was ready for warfare. Agreed? Whoa. See, it's okay to drop out of sight when you're in desert training and you know what's going on. Where have you been, Horton? I've been in desert training. Well, I know you've been gone for several weeks, several months, maybe several years. I know. I know. Didn't have no time to write no letters. I was in desert training. And it's complete focus, man. Desert training. That's where Jesus was for 18 years. Desert training. We know it because that's the first thing he got was the exercise. Think you're going to get by it? Uh, you think you're, it's no way. And you want it. You want it. You want your tabs. You want them. Then we go to undeserved suffering. This right here, undeserved suffering. Here is spiritual maturity. You've now reached spiritual growth maturity. And now right here is undeserved suffering. That's a key. Boy, what a key that is. I'll tell you a, th a thing about undeserved suffering. Nobody misses it in your periphery. Anybody who steps into your zone knows you're, you're in some kind of suffering. Huh? It's important for you to know what kind of suffering you're in. Not self-induced misery. Not divine discipline. Undeserved. Because when you get into undeserved training, it's part of desert training. It's, it's, 
SG2. And this is where, this is where it really it heats up and gets there. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They'd have to change their name if they were going to go on a t t circuit, wouldn't they? Uh, they, they, uh, listen, they come out of that. These guys are going to be something. Uh, that's desert training. Desert training. Philippians one twenty nine. It, it's been it, it's been granted to us not only to believe but to suffer for His namesake. Philippians one twenty nine. Are you saved? Yeah. Well, guess what's next on your list? Have you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes. Well, guess what's next on your list? Now, it may not come for 18 years, but it's next on your list. You don't get to pick it. It picks you. God in his marvelous grace fits it. It's amazing how he does that. It's amazing the way, he, the way he picks people to do undeserved suffering is the most amazing thing as a pastor because I look for that and it just amazes me. And I'll tell you something else I found to be interesting because I became that player. It's the people he puts around you in a support way to, make, to understand your journey and to be able to help you through it. Because I find those people are great life coaches. They're really good to keep that person up in a supportive manner and not interfere with their journey, not interfere with what God is doing in their life. And that's a difficult thing sometimes. And I find that really interesting. I, I look for that. I, it's interesting to me, the people that he puts into suffering that has this, has this ability to do it. And myself, I look at Jane and I go like, oh, cat, oh, wow, father. <sighs> How did she do that? And then I find myself in this, in this life coach position, I don't know another word to say, say it, that is, is amazing to me that I find this ability just to coach her on and just encourage her and teach her and just be there. And, and I see it in other people. As a pastor, I, I look for that stuff and I see it. And, I, and I'm, well, anyhow. Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 8 through 10 is very important. Uh, uh, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. Uh, power perfected in weakness for strength. Power perfecting in weakness gives strength. And it has nothing to do with the physical. It has to, everything to do with the spiritual. Mm. It's an amazing what these people can teach you about relationship with the Lord. It's amazing to me what they can teach you. Well, anyhow, a dying grace. Over here is dying grace. Dying grace. See, you want to reach it, you want to maintain it to dying grace. That's dying grace. You know, when I was a young believer... I've said this often, but when I was a young believer, I was so intrigued with the rapture that I, w I, I definitely wanted to be part of that rapture generation. Then I discovered that there were, there were a lot of things connected to dying grace that you would have for eternity. There were crowns and things. Then I went, hmm. Hmm. Well, does anybody get anything special for being caught up in a rapture? Yeah, they get their new body, but everybody's going to get that. Well, okay. 
So I've changed my whole attitude. Now, I know the rapture is coming and it would be all right with me. But dying grace, you die under dying grace. You, you die for God. Listen, no matter, listen, it, whatever the manner of your death has nothing to do with your dying. How you die, whether it's automobile or drowning or being burnt or shot, or you understand what I mean? I just went to a, hot, a lot of dark places, didn't I? Sharks, sharks. You'd have thought I'd been traveling with you in your, in your police car, wouldn't you? That sounded like a guy had been out on a, on a trip out here. It doesn't matter because that's not what dying is about. What, what I'm talking about, death, I'm talking about the transfer of the soul from the body to the presence of the Lord. That's dying grace. It's not the manner of your dying. I mean, that's what we see, and we go, oh, so bad. They, but look, that's not really the issue of what we, when we talk about dying grace, we're talking about the transfer, and the manner of the way you die is, has nothing to do you're going to have a sweet transfer. I don't care how the rest goes down. Don't panic. Don't let it go. Just forget it. Because in a split second of time, just let it go. If he wants you, he's going to keep you. There's no way you're going to get out of here without his approval. If you, if, you, if you stay, you go through it. It's all about that. Let it go. Don't fear. Because this is going to be a, a sweet transfer. A sweet transfer. Time to return to you. Boom, there you are. Well, anyhow. Dying grace. Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter, seven and eight. Dying grace. That's a great passage on dying grace, and it tells you that there is a crown waiting for you. Uh, second Peter, uh, Second Timothy. It's on your paper. I don't, but always look at your paper. Uh, sec, sec, I know, I know. I'm all over the place. Second, Second Timothy. The fourth chapter, seven, eight. And, and one of my all-time verses, and I put it down there because I'm the teacher, I can do that. I put Psalms 116, 15. Precious in the eyes of God is the death of, the God, of his godly ones. Precious in the eyes of God is the death of his, of his godly ones. I love that. I love that verse. That was one of the verses that God gave me after my automobile accident. Uh, and I was reading the Psalms. He gave me that verse, and I went, yeah, I like that. I like that. And then surpassing grace is the last one over here. And, you know, there's a crown offered there. Uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 6 and 7 is a great passage on surpassing grace. That's absent from the, you know, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But Ephesians talks about it in a wonderful way. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. This, listen, you get this because... You had the good sense to believe that. <laughs> you had the good sense to believe all that. Now, whether you go through all of this, that's a choice. If there's nobody here, everybody here, you're in the middle of this stuff somewhere. I got, I got, I got a whole church full of these people. I, they're, they're, they're all over this place. And it's important once you reach it to stay there. Don't give it up for nothing. Don't slide back down here because then you have to go work your way back up. Don't do that. That's, that's a... That, that's at um, Hebrews 5.11 that says, don't become dull of hearing. I mean, this is, this is all about the exercise. You stay, stay meat eaters. Stay inhale, exhale, daily basis. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. You know, that 2 Timothy 3.16.17, that's the name of the game. And, and then another verse over here that you want that, the other verse you want over there is um, uh, 2 Peter 1, 11 through 15 that, that's a powerful. And then we have talked about this down here. I, le I laid that up there. That's my, that's my other one to show you the desert training, right, on the bottom of the paper. I knew I wouldn't be able to get through that. It's on your paper. It, it's 2 Peter 1, 11 through 15. Oh, can't see it? Oh, well, good. Well, let me give it to you. At the very, very bottom, down, have, uh, I guess I gave you all the Bible. Did I write Bible verses in there like Colossians 1.28? Oh, good. Well, down at the bottom, here's what you want. And you want this on that. I, I hate that that didn't come through. Okay, too low. You want Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Now, I'll come back to this bottom another time. 
uh, it w probably won't be next week, but um, it, may, it could be even tomorrow. Um, I'm looking at uh, Sam. But anyhow, I don't know when I'll be back. But um, of Philippians, but I will come back to this subject because it's important. Uh, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. And I want you to pay attention to the word. Let, let, let's just look up that for a moment. Not, then I got to quit. I'm over time right now. Um, let's go to Philippians. I want to show you a key word about, uh, and, and that down there is about reach, reach super grace, maintain super grace to dying grace. Are you with me? Well, Philippians, the third chapter, uh, 12 through 14, uh, really Paul, Paul is into this subject in Philippians. Um, Colossians, uh, when, uh, Colossians, Ephesians, uh, uh, Philippians, he, he is really pounding this idea. Uh, and in the third chapter, um, he says, well, that's second chapter. You yeah, shouldn't get in a hurry because, it, you know, when I get in a hurry, I get, I make too many mistakes, right? I can't find my place. Where am I going? As I calm down, go, take a deep breath. There you are. Third chapter, verse 12. Not that I've already obtained it. This is what he's talking about now. Not that I've already obtained it. See, he's talking about through super grace, reaching the ultimate goal of dying grace and surpassing grace. He says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. That, that is, we, we would call that being able to hit uh, super grace one, two, and three to dying grace. But I pre the word press on. I press on in order that I may lay, lay hold of it, uh, of, of that, for which also I laid hold of by Christ Jesus. The word press on. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. In other words, Paul is talking about this process here. He's talking about this process that's going to wind up in dying grace and surpassing grace. He's going to talk about the resurrection power and all that. All of this is in that process. And so then he comes back in 14, I press on. See that word, press on. It means to pursue something. It, it's, like, it's like a police chase. It, 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 it's, it's the, it's, uh, the Greek word is to pursue, hot pursuit. Hot pursuit. Um, in verse 14, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, that's what super grace, he's talking about this super grace journey in here. This is exactly what he's talking about. And, and I don't have time tonight to go through it all, but he's talking about that so that you hit dying grace at full speed. You're going to hit dying grace and right there, boom, right into surpassing grace of eternity. Whew. Let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll have our special prayer. Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have been with us in our study, and we'll come back to this subject matter in a later date. We'll look at this super grace journey and the passages that deal with it and the, the key Greek words that Paul is going to use to talk about super grace. And so we'll, we'll be sure to bring our people along the journey of study on this subject matter. But tonight, Father, we've looked at the system, the grace system, that Christians have an opportunity under the new covenant. Every believer under the new covenant has this opportunity to, to reach all of this. Not just some like Joseph, everyone. Everyone has the power structure to do it. And oh, does Paul really lay that stuff out in the book of Philippians? Oh, Father. Mm. We'll get back to that in another study with it to be able to look at it technically a little bit. But tonight, Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you've taught us tonight, what our eyes have beheld, and I pray we would look at the simplicity of the six stages, understand their importance, and the other things we've seen through the life of Joseph. Thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish 
but have everlasting life. 